God, a mighty Savior. Uh, there is nothing that is beyond you or your capability. And you have loved us, Lord, with our everlasting love. We ask this morning that you speak to us, Lord, in accents clear and still, above the storms of passion and the murmurs of self-will. We ask, O oh God, that you anoint each and every one of us. May your Holy Spirit minister to our hearts the things that we need to hear. We ask, Lord, that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that the channels between heaven and earth might be made absolutely clear. Still our hearts and speak now, for we ask this in Jesus' name. I have titled this message that I want to share with you, Choosing God, Choosing God. And uh, I want to talk to us this morning, I want to talk to us about decisions, about choices, about how we go about making choices and making decisions. And I want to talk to us about the impact that this has long term. Now, I know it's warm, but I'm going to ask you to do your very best not to drift a little bit. Is that fair enough? And if someone beside you is drifting, uh, help them not to drift, if you catch my meaning. I think these are things that we need to hear and that we need to understand. I'm going to direct our attention to the very beginning, to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. And I want to look at verse 15 where it all began. And the Bible says that, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof Thou shalt surely die. I never thought much on these words, these two verses, these three verses. But as I began to meditate upon this, I recognized a couple of things that I want to share with you. That God created man and imbued us with a free will meaning that we have the freedom of choice. Now, when you look at the instructions that God gave, he said, you may eat this, but that you shall not eat. In other words, God is saying, this is what I created you for. Choose this. So God created, and God is not abandoning man, but he is saying, here is a pathway of life. Choose this and continue to live. Do not choose that. But the option was theirs. Because God wants us to worship him from a heart that is free of coercion, from a heart that is full of love and gratitude, because in love God created man as he knelt down and formed him, as he breathed into him the breath of life, gently, tenderly, lovingly. We came from the hand of an awesome creator. The right exercise of choice leads to obedience and an ever more intimate relationship with God. But the wrong exercise of the choice that God has given us leads us away from him into rebellion and into death. Are you following me? God gave instructions. And he says, choose this. As we began, 
as we reflect a little bit more on this, we recognize another thing coming from these two verses, or three verses, that the exercise of choice is character building. What we ultimately become is a result of the choices that we make. Genesis 1, 27 tells us that God created man in his own image and likeness, male and female. We were created to be God-like in character. At the very outset, Adam and Eve had the mind of Jesus Christ and were like God in character. By the right exercise of choice, this is strengthened, and we continue to abide in the vine, abide in Jesus, because outside of him, there is no life. Philippians 2 verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. God is, we have fallen away, and God wants to restore us from where we have fallen away from. But by God's grace through Christ Jesus, by the right exercise of choice, God is daily restoring us back to his image. The other point that we take away from this is that by the very makeup of man, we were made to exercise. Are you listening to me? We were made to exercise. We were created with a physical, mental, and emotional capacities that are meant to be developed and rightly used. Our capacities, our gifts on every plane must be developed through action, through exercise, and this exercise or action produces growth. Therefore, it's no wonder that in Eden, the character was allowed to be tested, that we might exercise our choice in choosing who it is that we would obey and follow. So decisions that we make build character, that we were meant to exercise our capacities to make choices that produces growth. The other thing that we recognize from these verses is that we did not make ourselves, nor were we created to live independent of our maker. We cannot sustain our life, it is derived. We have no wisdom of our own, it is derived. We cannot grow one cubic by our own will or turn one hair on our head from gray to black. We are only sustained by our connection with the Father through Christ Jesus. And our role is to act in harmony with God. Our joy, our peace, our delight, our health, our salvation is dependent upon this harmonious relationship with God. It's dependent on us abiding in the vine. The other thing that we pull from these few verses is that choices have consequences. When we choose against God, when we choose a path of rebellion and we persist in the path it means ultimately that we have chosen death. And God was very, very clear in Eden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is symbolic of rebellion and sin, which results in death. God warned, in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. But when we get to Genesis 3, 4, and 5, the serpent told the woman that she would not surely die, but that God has been withholding something from her and knows that your eyes, her eyes, shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now listen, what was the serpent telling, telling, uh, Adam, telling Eve? The serpent was telling the woman, you don't have to depend on God. You can be your own God, master of your own destiny. Determine your own pathway, independent of God. For when you eat, you will have the same knowledge and wisdom of God. In other words, he's saying to the woman, God lied to you. Take matters into your own hand. The instruction God gave you, his commandment, his holy law, is intended to hold you back, to prevent you from having fun and realizing your full potential. 
Choose the path of your own destiny. Forsake his instruction, for God does not desire your good. In a nutshell, that's what the enemy, the serpent, was telling the woman. So in chapter 3 of Genesis, mankind becomes involved in the controversy between God and Satan as God's character is challenged in our presence in the garden. Adam and Eve had a choice. Uh, they never gave God the benefit of responding to those accusations before choosing the path presented to them. Today, the enemy is throwing the same things at us. Choose your own destiny. I did it my way, not God's way. God is holding you back. Forsake his law. Forsake his instructions. When you do that, you can have pleasures in this life. But I want to share something with you about the law of God, about his commandments. I want to take you to Psalm 19. And when you look at Psalm 19, it tells us something about God's commandments, God's law, which is meant to protect us, which is meant to preserve us and save us from the evil that we are falling into. Verse 7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You want to be wise? You want wisdom? Stick with God. Stick with his commandments. Walk in obedience to him. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. God's way, God's way of life is not meant to be down and sad and kill joy. But it says it rejoices the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And then in verse 10, the psalmist tells us this, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, more than fine gold. Are we beginning to get the picture? The world is saying, step away from God. His commandments are restrictive. His law will hold you back. But the prophet is saying, you do that, it is death. But if you walk in his ways, man, you're going to have treasures. You're going to have delight. You're going to have pleasures. I want us to run to Psalm 119. I want us to highlight something else that God brings to us through his prophet. We're going to talk about the commandments because the devil has attacked God through his commandments, through his law. They are unjust. They are holding you back. Well, here is what David says in Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love, oh, how love I thy law. It is thy, it is my meditation all the day. Listen carefully. Though through thy commandments has made me wiser than my enemies, because they are ever with me. Stick with God. Stick with his law. Stick with his precepts. Stick with his statutes. They will give you wisdom. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. There's something powerful about the word of God. Then he says in verse 11, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. Yes, age does bring some amount of wisdom. But, but, when you keep the law of God, that is wisdom. That is true wisdom. You want to grow in wisdom? Stick with God. And then he says, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. God's commandments, his instructions, his holy law is designed to protect and preserve. Protect the freedoms that we have in Christ Jesus. Protect us from slavery to sin. Preserve us in him. Without him, without us abiding, there is no life. 
there is no us. Only as we abide in the vine do we have life. God only has life. It is unborrowed, it is underived, and he alone has immortality. And he is willing and wants to impart to share that life with each and every one of us. By making a wrong choice, we have fallen from grace. We have chosen our way. But what the serpent didn't tell Eve is that your way is my way. Having your own way, going your, doing your own thing, is following the devil. He didn't tell her that because he was deceiving her. God is holding back from you, but God isn't. The good news is that despite our fall from grace, despite our sin and rebellion, we are not abandoned to our chosen fate. For God has an everlasting love for us and will not leave nor forsake us. Every day of our waking lives, we are called upon to make choices. For every day is an opportunity for obedience or for rebellion. The results of decisions that leads to righteousness or rebellion is seen in Cain. And if you watch Cain and his descendants, they went steadily into evil. Cain chose a path of rebellion. I want us to understand this. Because in the Garden of Eden, though they were expelled, the garden was still there as a testimony. Though the angel was protecting it by a flaming sword, it was still there by, as, as, as a testimony to them of their fall from grace. But man still persisted in rejecting God time after time after time, thinking that he has a better way. The things that he wants, peace, happiness, joy, has been an elusive chase ever since. Cain chose a path of rebellion, and his descendants, based on their choices, descended progressively into evil. But God had a people who would choose him. When Seth was born, the record of Scripture in Genesis 4, 26 says, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called him name, he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. You could almost say, then began men to choose God once again. Because the line of Cain did not, but the line of Seth did. But there came a time, brethren, where the purity of the line of Seth was interrupted as they began to intermingle with the lineage of Cain. And when that happened, they made choices that led this world into such evil, such violence, that by chapter 6, God repented of the, of the thing that he had done, of making mankind, because his thoughts, his thoughts were evil, the Bible says, continually. But though God destroyed the earth in mercy, in mercy, he destroyed the earth. He still did not abandon his creation. Now I want to focus on God's call through the ages and his appeal to mankind because his appeal in Genesis still resonates with us today. God has been calling us to repentance, to make the right choice in our lives day by day. I want us to turn our Bibles to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And I want us to look at Moses as God's impassioned plea through his servant Moses. I'm not going to read all of this, but I'm just going to highlight a couple of, couple of verses here. When we look at 11 in chapter 30, what Moses is doing is bringing Israel to a reminder of the commandments of God. He's reminding them of the blessings of following the way of God, but he's also reminding them that choices have consequences, and when they reject God, they're going to reap the results of, of the seeds that they have sown. And in verse 11, he says, For this day, God, for this commandment, which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go 
go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it? But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. God is saying unto his servant Moses, I am not asking you for anything that's impossible. I am bringing it down to you in your consciousness so you might hear, you might understand what it is that the Lord does require of you. You need not go far to understand God's requirements. And he lays it out to them. And in verse 19, in verse 19, he says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, again, like in Genesis, God is saying, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Are you understand what God is doing? I want us then to come back to our scripture reading. 1 Kings chapter 18. Uh, we know the story. Israel has descended into evil as a result of the choices that they have made. They have wandered away from God, and God is winning them back to him in dramatic fashion. Elijah summons the prophets of Baal to Mount Carmel. Because he wants them to have an understanding of the path that they are persisting in. And God again, through his impassioned plea, pleads with his people. Pleads with his people. In chapter 18, we look. And we look at verse... 17. Now we understand that there was a tremendous drought in Israel because God had to arrest the attention of the people. And he arrested the attention of the people through a drought. And then Elijah summons everyone to Mount Carmel. And he's going he's to perform something before them to bring them to their senses because they have been steeped in evil. And verse 21 and Elijah came out unto all the people and said, How long, how long will he halt, go between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, and Baal could be anything outside of God. If it is not God, it is Baal. But if it is Baal, follow him. And the people answered him not a word. I want to give you two other translations. The voice translation says, how much longer will you sit on the fence, refusing to make a decision between the Lord and Baal? If you believe the Eternal One is a true God, then devote yourselves entirely to Him. But if you believe Baal is your master, then devote yourselves entirely to Him. Now the NCV version, uh, here is how it puts that. Elijah approached the people and said, how long will you not decide between two choices? Isn't that what God has always been saying? If the Lord is a true God, follow him. But if Baal is a true God, follow him. And the people said nothing. God's appeal throughout the ages brings back into sharp focus the real issue at hand. Are we getting that? Satan has muddied the waters with lies, with deceptions. He has muddied the waters with a number of different things, but God is cutting through the deception, the lies, the conditioning of our minds to set before us in a simple but profound way the choice, the life choice that we must make. Our choice is simple. It is life or it's death. You can only have life when you choose a life giver, the one in whom is life unborrowed and underived and who, who only hath immortality. The path of life is a path of choosing God and obedience to him. Any other way, recognized or not, is a pathway of Satan. Whom will you worship? God or the serpent? Because all life is worship. 
Romans 6 verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So we understand the choices, or do we? Do we understand the choices? Do you understand what God is calling us into? And God wants to put it in sharp focus and contrast. You hear a lot of messages through the media. You hear a lot of messages in the world. And God wants to cut through all the nonsense and says, here's the bottom line. Here's your choice. It's either me or it's not me. And if it's not me, it means that you're disconnecting yourself from the power source, from the life-giving source. And eventually, you will die. The question is, why is it that we sometimes choose that which is evil? And reject God. Why is it that we flip flop, believing that we can have the world in one hand and God in the other hand? We can have our cake, so to speak, and eat it. Why is it that we're not consistent in serving God and our heart is not wholly given over unto Him? I want to suggest a number of reasons. I want to suggest that firstly, our eyes and our hearts are not wholly fixed on God. It's not fixed on Jesus. I want to suggest, secondly, that not all our decision-making process is done consciously. Thirdly, I want to suggest that sometimes, oftentimes, we make choices that are led and conditioned by our senses, by what we feel, by what we hear, by our senses. And lastly, I want to suggest that often we lack vision. I want to make this plain to us, that God's expectation and standard for us is much higher than our expectation or standard that we have for ourselves. God wants to lift us a little bit higher. He wants to lift us out of the mire that we are stuck in, and he wants to carry us where he can show us his beauty that is divine. Serving God is not a sometime-ish thing. It's not something that we do on Sabbath morning only. It's not something that we just do in the morning worship and evening worship, and the rest of the time we do as we want, as we please. God wants us to permeate our lives with him, building upon his principles, demonstrating his royal character to all of those that we come in contact with in our business life, in our personal life, in our family life, in every sphere of our life, it is full time. There is not a time when you're not dwelling in the presence of God. And there's not a time when we are not serving God. I want to suggest also that we want to enjoy the benefits of this world in the here and now and still cling to the hope that we can be saved. But the principles of God and the principles of this world are diametrically opposed. You can't build your life on both. It is one or the other. We cannot serve God and serve this world. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and he will love the other. He will hold to one and despise the other. The question is, who are we serving? What decision, who, what decision have we made to serve? And who it is have we made that decision to serve? Jesus is asking us to choose. Not tomorrow. He's asking us to choose today. But choosing God involves a sacrifice. And sacrifice is not a popular word today in our culture. It is focused on me. It is focused on my interest. It is focused on what I can get how I can be self-serving. But the principles that God has outlined in his scriptures is that we must esteem others above ourselves, is that we must live a life that is unselfish. And you can't live that life without sacrifice. And sacrifice is not convenient. Is it a word that you have in your vocabulary? It should be ever on our tongue because Jesus, our substitute, sacrifice his life on our behalf. Inspiration puts it this way in the book Desire of Ages, page 25, paragraph 2. It says that Christ was treated as we deserve, you know the quote, that we might be treated as he deserves. 
He was condemned for our sins in which we had no share, that he, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered a death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his, and with his stripes we are healed. Jesus gave the supreme sacrifice for us, and he has asked us to sacrifice for his cause and for the cause of his people. Captured in these statements is the reality that Jesus' entire life was one of sacrifice on our behalf. Meditate on those words, I pray. Scripture teaches us that the things of greatest value are the things that are worth the sacrifice. The decision to serve God and act upon that decision may not win you the esteem of your friends. It may not result in financial success. It will mean exercising greater discipline over ourselves, and we may encounter even more struggles. But in spite of this, we shall have peace with God and the peace of God. Peace with God is possible because you and I have accepted Christ's work of reconciliation on the cross, which makes us right in his sight. We have repented. We have confessed our sins, given up our own path, our own ways, our rebellious attitude, and accepted his will for our lives. And we are therefore no more at enmity with him, but are brought into harmony and have fellowship now, sweet fellowship with Jesus Christ. I want to illustrate the point, and I want to use the parable that Jesus told. He just gave two parables in Matthew 13, 46. He used the parable of the hidden treasure, and he used the parable of the pearl of great price. In, the par in both parables, the person, when they have found it, what did they do? They went and they sold all that they may possess the hidden treasure and that they may possess the pearl of great price. Who is the pearl of great price? Jesus. Who is the hidden treasure? It is Jesus. The parable is telling us that God demands nothing less than our all for Jesus Christ. Are we understanding that? Nothing less than our all. Now, the Apostle Paul puts it this way, and I love what he says in Philippians 3. Just turn there with me and see how the Apostle Paul, under inspiration, puts it. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians come after Ephesians. Philippians chapter 3. I want to look at verse 8. <clears throat> Paul is saying that if he has reason to boast, above all men, he has more reason than any other. And he lists his credentials. But then when he gets to verse 7, he says... But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. I gave up the esteem. I gave up the fellowship. I gave up the membership in the clubs that I was in. I gave up certain, all the activities because I count Christ above all this. Then he goes on in verse 8. He says, ye doubtless, just in case you didn't understand what I said, and I count all all things but loss. I gave them up gladly and freely for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. How many things? All things. For whom I've suffered the loss of all things. And then he goes on. How do I regard these things that everybody highly esteem in this world? How do I regard it? Paul says, I count them but dung, refuse, waste, that I may win Christ. 
What did Paul give up? Everything. What must we give up to gain the pearl of great price? Everything. 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 That we may gain Christ. Paul chose Christ and he laid it all on the line for him. What is God calling us to do this morning? He is calling us to choose Christ and to give up everything that we might win Christ. I want us to understand that. When we look again at Genesis 2, as God put the decision before Adam and Eve, and he says, eat this, but do not eat that. Choose me, but do not choose that. Because when you choose that, it has consequences. God was appealing to our conscious mind. Do you know how we make decisions? We got to reason the pros and the cons. God wants to reason with us. Now, God has called us into a reasoning relationship. He doesn't want us to simply react out of what we feel, react out of anything else. Because in the reasoning process, he wants us to recognize truth. And from a recognition of truth, arrive at a right understanding and make right choices. Are you following me? God wants us to have a recognition of truth in the conscious mind. And from a recognition of truth, arrive at a right understanding and for us to reason out and make right choices for ourselves. Others act not out of reason, but they allow others to choose for them by simply following others, and they don't understand why they are walking in a particular path because they have not processed it consciously. They have not reasoned it out. They have not seen whether or not it is based on thus saith the Lord. What foundation is it based on? Now, it is true that it's good to follow others as they follow Christ, but we must stand on our own two feet and be able to give a reason for the faith that we have. How can you witness if you don't understand what it is that you're doing? or what God has done for you, or the promises of God. Reasoning brings awareness to our minds so that we can see our actions for what they are and see God who alone can wrought changes in us. God says, come now, come. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God wants us to bring us to an understanding, a recognition of where we are with him. That he may separate our sins from us. That we might be reconciled to him. That we might have life. I want to elaborate a little bit on the next point, And that is, sometimes we make decisions or choices based on how we feel the mood we are in or what it is that we are desiring. But listen carefully. That is not a good basis on which to make choices. If it is then, then we are likely to choose consistently that which makes us feel good. Let us step back for a moment and consider this fact. What we feel or our mood or temperament is, is influenced by, believe it or not, what we put in our bodies. For what we put in our bodies will determine our chemical balance. Are you listening to me? And our chemical balance affects our state of mind, affect what we feel. And if we are basing decisions based on what we feel, our inclinations, that is not informed by the Holy Spirit, guess what? We are going to get ourselves in trouble. 
The other factor is we make decisions sometimes based on what our thoughts are focused on. So our decisions are conditioned by our, let me go back over that. The other factor, what our minds are focused on. So we make decisions based on what our minds are focused on, but our thoughts conditions feelings and shapes behavior. So thoughts in turn influenced our influences are, are influenced by what we believe or what we put in our bodies, what we see, hear, and touch. Therefore, the injunction is given to us in the book Adventist Home, page 401, that all should guard the senses. Now, understand this. We act based on our thoughts. Our thoughts conditions our feelings. And if our, if our thoughts are conditioned by our senses, then we ought to take heed. And here's a quote. All should guard the senses, lest Satan gain victory over them, for these are the avenues of the soul, what we see, what we hear, what we listen to, what we touch, the full range of senses. The only basis for making right choices is principle of God's word. Every Christian will have to learn to restrain his passions and be controlled by principle. Unless he does this, he's unworthy of the Christian name. Adventist home, page 328. And when we go to the Bible, and the Bible tells us in 1 John 2, 15, for all that is in the world, all that is in the world, what are they? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. We have to guard the avenues to the senses, the avenues to the soul, to the mind, so that our thoughts can be focused continually on, on God and be kept pure and undefiled. Because out of the thoughts comes the actions. But the, act, the, the thoughts also have an influence upon what we feel and condition what we feel as well. So we need, we're counseled. We need to be careful. We need to be careful. There are times when our choices also are conditioned. And I was trying to find an ample illustration for this conditioning. And I will make an attempt to explain what I mean by conditioned. The choices that we make is not made all at once, but we make several choices every day each day of our lives. Amen? Because as living individuals, we must make a choice. But the choices are not always rooted through the mind. Some choices are conditioned by decisions we have made previously. Uh, let me put it this way. I grew up in a Methodist church. I was conditioned to think a particular way especially as it regards the Bible. So when I read the Bible, I was reading the Bible in light of the conditioning that I had received. And therefore, the conditioning I received made me read the Bible with a particular understanding from the Bible. But then, God spoke. And God said, forget about all the understanding that you have received, the things that you have been told. Wipe the slate, slate clean. Read the Bible for itself. Let the Word of God stand on its own. Let the Bible be its own interpreter. Compare Scripture with Scripture. And as I began to do that, I saw the error of the position of the faith that I was in. Are you following me? That may not be the best illustration, but it's an illustration of conditioning. Now, I want to give you another 
illustration of conditioning. Go with me to the book of Daniel. I believe it is Daniel chapter 5. And this is a good conditioning. There are some times when our decisions are conditioned, predicated upon bad things. It's not based on a principle of God's word. But this one is. Uh, this one is. What chapter did I say? Daniel chapter 5. No, I'm not looking at Daniel chapter 5 at all. I think I'm looking at chapter 3. Let's look at Daniel chapter 3. You know the story. I won't delve a lot into it. But, in essence, the king makes a statue, and the king says, when you have, whenever you hear the music, you must fall down and worship this statue. Okay, fine, no problem. But there were three men, young men, who refused to bow down. And because of their refusal to bow down, they were brought before the king. Now, the king had made a decree also that if they did not bow down, that they would be thrown in the furnace. And the king brought them, and the king began to explain unto them again what it is that he was all about. And he says, look, you need to do this and that, and what of you, and who is, in verse 15, at the end of verse 15, and he says, and who is that God shall deliver you out of my hands? And in verse 16 it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, we don't need to think about this. We don't need to make a decision about what you're asking us to do. Our decision is long made. We are not careful to respond to you in this particular way because God is able to deliver us. But if he is not, we will not bow down and serve you. And the point I'm making is that God wants all our decisions to be based on thus saith the word of God. Now what did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego know? And here's what they knew. Uh, they knew that God in, in his commandment said, Thou shalt not make any image and bow down and worship him. Worship the Lord God. They had a relationship with the living God. They had no need to consider what was before them. They also knew that the image that Nebuchadnezzar had made, which was all gold, was supposed to be an extension of his kingdom. But they knew that God is the one who sets up kings and kingdoms and takes, takes it down. And they knew the king didn't have any power to give life or take life, but their, that their life was in the hands of God. And they said, King, we are not careful. We are not careful. We are making our decision, and it has already been made based on the principle of God's word. And that's sufficient for us. How is it with us? How is it with us? Now, I want to draw us to a couple of quotations from the book, Mind, Character, and Personality. And there's one particular chapter. Because in the making of decision, we call into play the use of the will. And I want to tell you what it is said about the use of the will. The will is a governing power in the nature of man, bringing all the other faculties under its sway. The will is not the taste or the inclination. It is the deciding power which works in the children of men unto obedience to God or unto disobedience. Now the will is then enlisted on the side of God and right. If the will is enlisted on the side of God and right, the, fruits, the fruit of the Spirit will appear in the life. God has appointed glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good. So if our will is submitted to God, then we will see the fruit of the Spirit being the evidence of that. 
Philippians 2 verse 13 tells us, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. But there is a part that we must do. And this is the point I want to bring across to you. Uh, listen again to the following quote. Uh, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, does not propose to do our part, either in the willing or in the doing. This is the work of the human agent in cooperating with the divine agencies. As soon as we incline our will to harmonize with God's will, the grace of Christ stands to cooperate with the human agent, but it will not be the substitute to do our work independent of our resolving and acting decidedly. Therefore, it is not the abundance of light and the evidence piled upon evidence that will convert the soul. It is only the human agent accepting the light, accepting what God what God has provided already for us, arousing the energies of the will, realizing and acknowledging that which he knows is righteousness and truth, and just cooperating with the heavenly ministrations appointed to God in the saving of the soul. Are we getting that? The Holy Spirit will not do our part. We must resolve and we must act. When we do that, then the Holy Spirit will come in and cooperate with us. And God will empower us to live the life that he wants us to live. But the resolving and the doing, the effort is on our part and on us. And too often we have backed off and we have said, God will do. Yes, he will do his good pleasure. But he does it through us. But we got to cooperate. It's going to take effort. It's going to take sweat. And sometimes it will take tears. But it will take all of us. Are you getting the picture? We must be entirely invested. Remember the parable of the pearl of great price? All must be given. It can't be part of us. We must not be partially invested, but we must completely be completely invested. But there is good news, and I want to share the good news with us. Though our choices may have led us away from God, here is a hope that we have today. And I want us to, to, want us to understand this clearly. Listen to what God says through the prophets. God is ever coming after us. He's ever seeking after us to bring us back into our right relationship and into laying before us quite clearly the choices that we must make. And in Isaiah 49, 15, he says, Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palm of my hands, and thy walls are continually before me. Friends, I want to tell us that God is crazy about us. He is crazily in love with us. There is something called love that simply does not allow him to give up on you or on me. Friends, Jesus wants us, and he wants you in the kingdom. All his love was poured out on Calvary on that cruel cross. All provisions have been made. And he's waiting for you to choose him and do your part in accepting his provision for your salvation. I want to tell you, the mansions are just about ready. The new Jerusalem just about complete. And the signs are telling us that his coming is near. But there is work for you, for us to do, so that we can be ready. Every time we do not choose him, his heart breaks. Now when Jesus says that he has, God says that he has engraved us on the palm of his hands, do we understand what that means? He will not forget us. He cannot forget us. It is interesting that when Jesus rose from a death and he appeared unto his disciples, and there was a man called Thomas who doubted his resurrection, and he says, put your finger in my side, look at the palm of my hands. Those nail prints... Those nail prints is the engraving of your name and my name on the palm of Jesus' hands. When Jesus heals, in my mind, when you have a cut and Jesus comes and he heals, that wound is completely restored, no mark of a scar. But Jesus bears a scar because he has irre irrevocably, that's the word, yes, I believe it is, identified himself with humanity, with you and with me. 
He has you on his mind. And he wants us to choose him. Stay with me a little bit longer. We are told by the prophet that eternity alone can reveal the glorious destiny to which man, restored to God's image, may attain. But in order for us to reach this high ideal, that which causes the soul to stumble must be sacrificed. Whatever is in our way, whatever calls us from reaching out to the ideal that God has in for us, must be given up. The surrender of the will is represented as a plucking out of the eye or the cutting off of the hand. And often it seems to us that to surrender the will to God is to consent to go through life maimed or crippled. But friends, I'd rather go through life maimed or crippled with the promise that I have attained unto Jesus Christ than be without him forever. Revelation 7.3 and Revelation 14.1 refers to the sealing of God's people in their foreheads. And John saw the 144,000 people having the Father's name written in their foreheads. Now we know the forehead represents a frontal lobe. It's a seat of reasoning and decision making. We also know that having the Father's name in the forehead is having the character of God perfected in us. We have his character. So... They possess the character of God because they have made the decision to serve God. They have yielded their will to him. They are settled in the truth and like the three Hebrew boys, cannot be moved from the truth. And they live out the gospel of Jesus Christ in their lives. God wants you and I to be among that throng because they are going to be with him. But there is more. There is more. I want to share this with you because God loves you. The prophet says, And I saw that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary. Through the time of trouble, those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. They must reflect the image of Jesus fully. I saw that many were neglecting the preparation so needful and were looking to the time of refreshing and to the latter rain to fit them to stand in the day of the Lord and to live in his sight. Oh, how many I saw in the time of trouble without a shelter. They had neglected the needful preparation, therefore they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to fit them to live in the sight of of a holy God. That is sad. Those who refuse to be hewed by the prophets and fail to purify their souls in obeying the truth and who are willing to believe that their condition is far better than it really is will come to the time of the falling of the plagues and then they see that they needed to be hewed and squared for the building but there will be no time then to do it and no mediator to plead their cause before the Father. Before this time, the awful, solemn declaration has gone forth. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. I saw that none could share the refreshing, the falling of the Holy Spirit, unless they obtain the victory over Every, every besetment over pride, over selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. We should, therefore, be drawing nearer to the Lord and be earnestly seeking that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle of the day of the Lord. Let us all remember that God is holy and none but holy beings can ever dwell in his presence. Friends, the warning is given because God wants us to see our condition. 
Because thou seest that I am rich and increased with goods, have no need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel of thee. This is why God brings us to, to this point. I counsel of thee. God wants us to recognize our need and come to him, that we may buy gold tried in the fire, that we might be rich and have white raiment to cover our nakedness, that thou may be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear and that our eyes may be anointed, that we may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and be zealous, therefore, he saith to the Lord, decent church, and repent. God is crazy about us, but he cannot save us in our sins. Choose Jesus, knowing that he which has begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I want to close with you by looking at Revelation 22. Revelation chapter 22. 17. This is God's appeal to us. The, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Come. Come to Jesus. Choose Jesus. And let him that heareth say come you have heard the word come to jesus but don't just come by yourself bring others with you come jesus says let him that is a thirst come and whomsoever will the invitation is out to everyone to all mankind whomsoever will let him take the water of life freely i end with this appeal God is crazy about you. He has gone to prepare mansions for us. I believe they're just about ready. I believe the new Jerusalem is just about ready. And is about to, and Jesus is about to make an appearance. I believe with all my heart that God is so crazy about us. That he is saying unto us, hey, look, if you overcome, and by the way, to overcome, we have all the resources of heaven. Jesus says, all power is given unto me. You ask, it is given. But we must abandon our sins. We must let go of this world. And we must come to Jesus. But Jesus says, come, I am ready I want you in my kingdom. Not only do I want you in my kingdom, but Jesus is saying that we shall be there in the new earth, the new Jerusalem. God is saying that earth made new is going to be controlled central, the center of the universe. His throne will be based here, and guess what? We'll be with him. That's his promise. But he's so crazy about us. He's saying, I will give you a seat on my father's throne, even as I have sat down on my father's throne. Mercy. The rebellious child, the prodigal son returning home. My, what God wants to confer on us. Do you want it? Do you want to choose God? Do you want to choose God? I'm not asking this for an emotional appeal. I'm asking this, and I'm asking you to process it through your mind, through your consciousness. Do you want to let go of all that this world has to offer and hold on to Jesus Christ? Are you prepared to give your all to Jesus? Invest your all. Give up all. Count all but dung that you may gain Christ. Are you? I'm going to ask you to stand if that's your decision. And as you stand, I'm going to invite Elder Robert to come forward. And he's saying, not me. I'm going to ask Elder Robert to pray for us. Father Lord, Father Lord, as we are standing before you, we are standing, Lord, for a commitment. Lord, we want to commit that in every aspect of our lives, we will choose you. We will choose your way. We will choose your directions. We will choose, Lord, whatsoever you tell us to choose. And Lord, it will demand changes. It will demand commitment. It will demand efforts. But Lord, we know that you're more than able to provide above anything that we need and desire. 
And so, Lord, at this time, we want to submit our lives to you once more. At this time, Lord, we pray for more strength that we may be obedient unto all things. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. Continue to bless us, Lord, and to strengthen us. And help us, Lord, at any time we come at a crossroad to choose you and only you. Help us, Lord, to deny ourselves for your benefit, for your glory, for your power. And I thank you, Lord, for giving us this chance. And I thank you, Lord, for putting it in our hearts, Lord, to want and to desire to follow you in all things. I thank you, Lord, and I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.